as fantastic a CFP as Mel O is, as wonderful an attorney as I am, and as good as Stormy is at whatever it is he does, please do note that anything said in our podcasts are our opinions alone and are not meant to be taken as financial or legal advice. Welcome to Finances, the other F word, a Gen Xer podcast for musicians and music lovers, where we discuss money and music without all the pretentious bullshit. Here are your hosts, Zoe Terry, attorney at large, Stormy Andrews, founder of Yoko Local Marketing, and Mel O, certified financial planner and author of Finances, the other F word. Listener discretion is advised. Hey guys, welcome to Finance is the Other F Word. Today we are going to be discussing the discrepancy between CEO pay and average worker pay. Zoe is looking at me. Disparity. Disparity. There you go. We are going to be talking about the disparity of income between studio musicians and rock stars, CEOs and average workers. And we're going to let Zoe take it away and start. Oh, I was not expecting that. So thank you, Mel. Oh. Um, well, actually, I like to keep you on your toes. Yes, I'm on my toes. Actually, what I was going to talk about was a documentary that I watched the other night, and it's about um, the uh, person who wrote the um, song that became The Lion Sleeps Tonight. We all know that song, right? In the jungle. I don't, well, Is that it? I, yeah. it's something like that, but yes. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're both, you're both, you're both yeah. fucking it up. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so it's a documentary called A Lion's Trail. Um, and it follows a white South African uh, journalist called Rian Malan, um, who wrote an article for um, the Rolling Stone in 2000 uh, about the real person who wrote uh, The Lion Sleeps Tonight. Uh, who was called Salomon Linda, and he wrote it in 1939, and it was actually called, at that point, I knew I was going to fuck this up, Mbube, right? M- Mbube. 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 Let's all say that together. M-B-U-B-A. Mbube. M-B-U-B-E. Okay, Mbube. Okay, well you said say it together, and then instead of saying it, you spelled it, so I know. you kind of fucked me up. All right, okay. go ahead. Mbube, which means lion in, okay. um, in Zulu. Uh, anyway, so he was... Like an African boombata in the Zulu nation. Go ahead. Whatever you just said. So Solomon Linda uh, wrote this song, um, Mbube, uh, in 1939 when he was in, in this choir in South Africa. Um, and uh, he... It, it then went on to be uh, written, uh, rewritten and made into this huge song that was then uh became the the lion sleeps tonight and this documentary which is really really interesting documentary actually um follows how it uh, follows the, the, the this poor man ended up dying penniless um in the 60s um and it's all about how he never got the royalties he was he was uh as, in, as a lot of musicians uh, yeah mm. uh, he was entitled to uh the the song ended up being recorded uh as whim away by pete seeger and the weavers in the 50s or the 60s um and as far as pete seeger was uh, aware he thought it was like a traditional african so- folk song mm. like, that had just been so he didn't know somebody had he didn't, made it yeah, originally he didn't know that it was uh, you know there was an original composer it was called like um what's known as a wild horse as far as he was known uh, as far as he was aware like green sleeves or something like that no original composer um, anonymous yeah like it was by anonymous right. so the, but the record company knew otherwise, and they used a fictitious name of Paul Campbell to collect the royalties. Um, and Pete Seeger, um, when I, I believe he came, became aware at some point that there was this guy, Solomon Linda, that had written Mbube and said, make sure that he's taken care of. And the record company was like, yeah, sure, sure we will. But they, they never did. Um, and... At some point, Solomon Linda had apparently signed a contract in the 50s um, 
an accession of copyright, copyright or something, signing away all his rights to his co- to the copyright. But uh, he had four daughters uh, in, that was that survived him, and they said he couldn't read, he couldn't write. Let so alone, he had no idea what he yeah, was signing. If he did sign, which they said that was in dispute because he couldn't sign his name, and there's a signature there, and they said that that's not him. He couldn't oh, even so sign his name. Oh, so they even forged his signature. Well, they're just saying if he did sign his name, he didn't know what he was signing, but they didn't even believe he signed it. But anyway, so he had four surviving daughters, and then this this uh, white South African journalist, Rianne Milan, uh, who for his own reasons, which if you watch his documentary, you'll you'll see why decided to kind of make it his life's work to make sure that this the four surviving sisters who ended up just being three because one of them died of HIV they were you know very poor the dad um, ended up dying penniless they lived in poverty uh, and they didn't they had no idea that this song had ended up becoming um, like I said yeah it was written recorded by Pete Seeger as Wim Away and then it went on to be re-recorded and um be become what we now know as the lion sleeps tonight by the tokens um and george weiss in 1961 um solomon linda died uh, in 1962 like i said with with no money he'd actually was working packing records at one point oh, which is so kind ironic of ironic and ironic evil. yeah wow um, so anyway, this song continues to, it was recorded, The Lion Sleeps Tonight, not only by the tokens, um, I don't know if it was a big hit over here, but in England it was a huge hit by Tight Fit, and even NSYNC did a version of it, I don't oh, know if I you know, know that, that which know that. you need to look that up because that's hilarious. I will. I'll put it on the playlist. Um, but then it became uh, a version of it, The Lion Sleeps Tonight, um, was included in The Lion King. So... Um, as this this uh, journalist uh, Rian Milan continues to try and investigate and and make it right, uh, he decides to help this family uh, sue Disney because he thinks, well, oh, that's that's a way to to get the family um, uh, some compensation. compensation. And by now, there's only three daughters left, like I said. Uh, so they managed to get a top South African lawyer involved um, and they found some loophole using British copyright law um, to argue that the, his copyright, that his rights reverted back to his heirs when he died. And so there was still, it wasn't time barred and things like that. And Disney, in the end, right before trial, agreed to a confidential settlement. So you think, oh wow, well, that's that's all, it's all good. That you know these these people that weren't even aware that their father had been, you know, done out of a huge amount of money. We're going to get we're going to get their money. But even then, uh, it wasn't a happy ending. Um, it was a uh, confidential settlement amount, but they wouldn't just give these women the money. They decided to put it into a trust. Um, and there became this huge, big allegation that the trust was mismanaged. Uh, they wouldn't just, you know, like I said, let these three grown women handle their own money. It was like they had to protect them from money. Themselves. You know, protect them from themselves. Protect them from themselves, which they obviously, they had no right to do. These are adults. Right. Uh, so they had these trustees looking after the trust. And there was all these allegations from the sisters that uh, the trust was mismanaged. <laughs> the trustees were saying that the the sisters drunk the money away and squandered the money and um, ten years on the still this was this, this dispute going on and uh, and this uh, Mr Milan went back and was still desperate to to try and help these women because he didn't feel like they'd got the justice they deser- deserved even after all this time and he himself tried to do an accounting of the trust. Uh, which by now all the trustees had left, and these women are better off, but not the right. the multimillionaires which they felt they should be, because this song had made millions mm-hmm. for for Disney and for all these other people. Um, and he felt, you know, from what he could find, he felt felt that the trust hadn't been mismanaged, but from his accounting, it appeared to him that each sister had got less than two hundred and fifty thousand wow. dollars each. Wow. Um, and it was just if you see the documentary it's just a it's just a real sad story sounds like a kick in the teeth yeah 
Yeah. Well, so. and you know, that made me think of Dr. Dre and George Clinton because when hip hop first came online in the early 80s, there was tons and tons and tons of sampling. Like I just mentioned, uh, Africa Bumbada and the Zulu Nation. Right. So um, Planet Rock. By, do you know what I'm talking about? By rock, Africa. rock, planet, planet rock. rock. Yeah, don't that, stop. That's right. Roller How skating, was that? roller skating. So it was great. It was yeah, great. See? Roller I'm skating song, like a champion. There was a ton of sampling going on in the early '80s, and they were just lifting a whole a whole bunch of stuff. And then in um, the early '90s, before Dre released the Chronic, he was like, "Okay, so George Clinton was basically destitute." And everybody's using all of George Clinton's speech because they're just, they were amazing beats. And so Dr. Dre was like, no, I'm not going to have this. So he made sure that George Clinton got a portion of the royalties. And then it wasn't too soon after that where they came out with a law that said, hey, you can't just lift everybody's shit, you know? So like Rolling Stones, um, they let the Verve uh, borrow the um, horns, or not the horns, the violins, and Verve did uh, Verve did a Bittersweet, Bittersweet Symphony. Symphony. Right. Yeah, well, they've and- only just settled that dispute though right what, was it well i don't I, I don't know did it just settle because what mm-hmm. happened is is that the rolling stone said yeah you can use that but then since the the violins were used throughout the entire song the rolling stone said oh well, we didn't know you were going to use it for the entire song and so then they sued them after they'd got permission to use it <laughs> that was so, that we just posted that on one of our facebook posts did you i did not yeah. see that mm-hmm. article yeah, yeah. i tell you yep. you need Dude, to pay attention i need to get on now it pay attention to your own Friggin' Facebook. You should you should probably have let me know that before we started recording. Yeah. Yeah. We may or may not keep this. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. we'll in see what editing. happens. We'll see in editing. Anyway. But um Well no. <laughs> we may not because we started off on a different topic. Didn't we? No. Oh, okay. I'm lost. <laughs> well, you're always lost, so that's fine. <laughs> hey, but oh. a Rolling Stone, I do have a Rolling Stone uh a bit of trivia for you. Okay. So like in two thousand fourteen, Rolling Stones did a concert in Tel Aviv. Uh huh. And they reached out to a school, and they got a few members from the choir to do backup singing. Uh-huh. And they made $6.7 million on the concert, but guess how much they paid these backup singers? Oh, God. Oh. Barely anything, I'm sure. I, I want Take them- a guess. I like to, you know, it's all about the suspense. Backup singers. Well, we're going to tie that into something later. Uh, backup singers uh, for just the one performance? Uh, let's see something. The Rolling. I'll read the article. The Rolling Stones recently played their first concert in Israel playing in Tel Aviv on June 4th. This was in 2014. The band asked a choir from Tel Aviv University School of Music to sing backup at the concert. So during oh, the concert. Okay, during the, so the full concert. Yep. Okay. I'm going to say $500 each. Okay. Zoe, what do you say? I'm going to say that my Brit boys are a bit more generous than that okay. and that they paid them uh, $100,000. They paid them 200 shekels. Do you know what that converted to? No. To, yeah, the shekel. Fifty-seven dollars yeah. seventy-six cents. <gasps> no. I was going to say the shekel is is less than the dollar. <laughs> yeah, fifty-seven. And bucks. the pound. They got fifty-seven bucks, but they do get bragging rights. I sung back up with yeah, the Rolling Stones. Yeah, but you know what would Give be them nice. Some money. It would yeah. be nice to get five thousand dollars and bragging rights. I think Absolutely. that would be that would be yeah. perfect. Oh, uh, yeah. There you go. Yeah, it's horrible, and the, and the reason why this podcast. Um, idea came about is because we had talked a very kind of slowly touched on the the uh, the uh, rock festival episode where we talked about the discrepancy between between ceo pays and the average worker right and so that got us thinking about studio musicians and those types of things so i i know that people on the visual can only see it but nobody else can see it so i'm wearing my my what does that say stormy music no um, Do you have your glasses? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let Musi. me just read it. No, it says Muscle Shoals oh, Sound, yeah. Sist- yeah. Sound Studio. Yeah, I, say, right? I can't see that. And then I'm wearing a shirt that says Fame Muscle Shoals. Okay. So there's there's uh, some studio musicians that we got to recognize. But before we go to Alabama, how about the Wrecking Crew? It's all about the Wrecking Crew. Not the World Class Wrecking Crew, oh. which was Dr. Dre's first band. I you guys you know were, what I'm talking about? Uh, yep. I thought you were going with Ralph and the Wrecking Crew. My bad. No, because we're all over five here. So we we haven't seen that. But no. The, well, yes, the Wrecking Crew. I remember yeah, the Wrecking Crew from the 80s. Before you turn off the lights, yeah. right? With Mich- I think Michelle A was in there where who, for some reason she sang beautifully, but she had an annoying fucking voice. And um, so the Wrecking Crew was a, a studio musician group that was out of L.A. and they operated between the 1960s and the 1970s. They came, they played backup on so many songs that you guys would know. Um, He's a Rebel by the Crystals, 
boots are made for walking and it's very interesting because at the very beginning of that song boots are made for walking where the the bass goes boom 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 boom, 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 boom. boom, boom. yeah right. so a studio musician created that really but gets no rights no to it gets no kind of credit to it because he's a studio musician wow but I guess like the guy who created post-it notes was working for 3M at the time. Right. I believe it's 3M. And then so because he was he was working in the functionality of 3M at the time, they owned anything that he created. Interesting. So I don't know if it runs off the the same premise. Um, also, you lost that loving feeling, which we talked about on the tax podcast, the Isley Brothers, and on the artists who went bust. I got you, babe. Good vibrations, of course, which has an amazing, uh, as far as Beach Boy songs, is a great song. And for Zoe, Beach Boy suck. Oh, uh, help me, Rhonda. Nothing. Yeah, no, no, I'm not None a big fan Boys, either. Yeah. Oh, no. I can okay. listen to them once, and I'm like, okay, no, that's I, enough. I, I well, can't. you know what? I, yeah, clearly they're better if you're on a beach and you're drunk. But I mean, if yeah, you're even then, yeah, they still I'd suck. rather listen to the the ocean than Beach Boys. I get mad at Spotify. I keep saying, you know keep deleting blocking, the, the blocking, blocking Beach, Boys? Beach Boys and they keep playing Beach Boys. Really? The hell, There's something in your profile that must, yeah, they make, must be like, Stormy, be, this like is just your Boys. kind of thing. <laughs> Stormy's a Beach Boy kind of guy. And, Absolutely. And Strangers of the Night by Frank Sinatra, which I am I love Sinatra. If you've li- uh, seen our feed, you you know that. And also Bridge Over Troubled Waters oh, by Simon and Garfunkel. Yeah. But getting back to Alabama, the reason why I wore all of my attire today is because there was the Fame Studios in Muscle Shoals, um, Alabama. So Sweet Home Alabama by Leonard Skinner. Right. They actually made them famous. Um, they were saying now Muscle Shoals, they got the Swampers, boo, boo, boo. And they've been known to write a song or two. Anyway, so they, this is the whole rhythm section of the Swampers. They started off in the Fame Studios in Muscle Shoals. Okay. And then I think they had a conflict with the owner or something and they broke off. And they went and they found founded Sound Studios and Muscle Shoals. So I had to wear both of my attire, and you can go on a tour there. It's amazing. It's really not that impressive, but at the Sound Studio, right. it's amazing and not that impressive. It's amazing. Well, because you're expecting you're expecting like a big something, and it's really like a shithole room with a piano in the middle of it, literally. But they have kind of landmarks like where Mick Jagger sang "Wild Horses" and that kind of stuff. And so Love they that, so. they have a lot of they have a lot of things like that. So I had to represent both of them. But the Swampers was a huge, very successful rhythm section, all white people, which is kind of crazy when you hear some of the songs that they were actually able to produce. And at the time, they were making $75 an hour, which that's big money back which then. At the, it was big money, which equates to approximately $480 an hour now. Yeah, that's solid. So, I mean, it was still good. But, I mean, when you look at the hits that they helped produce, Sweet Home Alabama, of course, Mustang Sally. Okay, okay, that yep. was later covered by Eric Clapton. So think that the original, and I, I can't remember who originally did it now, he he released it. There was royalties paid to him. Then Eric Clapton re-released it. And then there's royalties paid to him. Wow. But the studio musicians who probably created most of that sound never got paid. I never, never loved a man the way that I love you by Aretha Franklin. Mm-hmm. Okay. And Respect. This is the rhythm section. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll take you there by the staple singers. And then of course, um, main street by Bob Seger. Bob Seger was a a big, uh, you know, a big um, artist who always went and recorded out of those studios. And so we're, we're starting to see the divide between it's like the 80, 20 rule where 20% of the people make 80% of the money. Right. And so it, it had me very curious um, when we started looking at another entertainment sector, that's not necessarily music, but in acting, and so, uh, did you guys get to see Endgame? Infinity? Oh, yes, saw Endgame. Did you no. see it? You didn't see it? Okay, so we will, we'll try not to spoil it for Zoe. Are you going to see it? Uh, those kind of movies I like to go to and sleep through. So, oh, it doesn't so matter. So, that would be a no. You, okay, yeah. so fuck it. Let's just yeah. move on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, this was very interesting because I had heard about some creative um, financing that they had used for the, the movie. Okay. So, Robert Downey Jr., Iron Man, mm-hmm. super fuckable. He was also in Less Than Zero. And that's when I was hot on him. Uh, anybody remember Less Than Zero, the movie from the 80s? Vaguely. Yeah. Mm, he was, so he mm. played a drug addict, which, if you know his past, was not yep. really a, oh, a far stretch. Yeah. Yep. So an average stuntman. So for in-game, just for Captain America for in-game, just for him, there were six different stuntmen. For Robert Downey. No, no, for Cap, the, the guy who played Captain America. Oh, okay, got I'm it. I'm just trying Chris to give Evans. you, yeah, I'm just trying to give you an idea. So the highest paid stunt man makes you know about three thousand six hundred fifty five dollars per week 
thirty six hundred dollars a week. Got it? No, three. Yep, three. Yep, three thousand six hundred fifty five dollars a week. Okay, that's top dog. That's that's top dog. That's like you're the fucking man. Okay, so Robert Downey Jr. He swung a deal where he said, okay, for all the movies that I'm in, he's like, I want to get anywhere between five to seven percent of the gross. Of the movies, yes, of the movies that I'm in. So Infinity Endgame. So if this is, if you guys have not seen this movie yet, it's okay. a, I'm going to spoil alert. it. I'm going to spoil it. You should have seen it by now. It's about to go. Right. To yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Robert Downey Jr. dies. Oh. Iron Man. Iron Man dies. And oh. so does um, Scarlett Johansson's character. Widow. Black. What was it? Uh, Black Widow or whatever. Black Widow. That works. Yeah. I never understood what she did anyway besides look hot. Yeah, I mean, she didn't. What does she need to do? She had no special power. She had nothing. See, that just tells you how how our um our culture is that a hot hot lady can do absolutely nothing. And she got paid twenty million for the the thing. But the in game grossed one point five billion dollars. You got five percent wow. of that, and Come that on. would equate to without his base salary seventy five million dollars ish. No way. Just from the take. Not bad. Okay, <laughs> so in the movie, because of course now he's very. Con- I'd kill him off too. Yeah, <laughs> right. And enough I enough is enough. And apparently, Robert. he apparently he wanted to go, which Yo, is crazy. I'm like, got- I don't give a damn if you're tired of playing that character. But see, when you start making that much money, money just doesn't register the same way right. anymore. You know, when you're looking at, hey, I got to pay this bill, or I want to go get lunch today, it's just a, a whole different set of rules. Right. And so I wanted to parlay that before we start talking about the difference between CEO and worker compensation. Right. I wanted to parlay that into our national debt real quick. So we've got a national debt. We have a huge, huge fucking national debt um, that we have just actually crested twenty-two trillion dollars on. Okay. Oh, we just put twenty. Wait, say that again. We our national debt has just crested over okay, twenty-two, 22 tr- trillion dollars. So I want you guys to understand something, and this is going to be a different podcast, but this is really important that you guys kind of understand how this works. What is that, like 500 Jeff Bezos? Um, I'm just doing math the way yeah, I do. Yeah, I don't know, but I'll tell you in seconds. Okay. I figured it out um, in seconds. It was before the pyramids were built. Wow. So 22 trillion seconds ago was before we had written language, before people were painting on cave walls. Right. Okay. So we just crested that, and we have a thing called GDP. GDP is gross domestic product, right. and it's basically think of it as the the it's a measurement of what the nation produces. But think of it as income coming into you. Our twenty two trillion dollar debt is now one hundred and five percent of our GDP, which means that if you were bringing in money, your debt would be one hundred and five percent of your income. Okay, so let's say I'm making let's make easy numbers. Let's say I'm making one hundred grand a year. That means I now owe one hundred and five thousand dollars in credit card bills. Correct. Okay, got it. And this is what happened to Greece. Okay, so when the whole when we were going through the whole um, when Europe and and Zoe's nodding, so she probably has a little bit more insight on it than me. When we were going through our whole, you know, we went through our recession in two thousand and eight. We gave Europe our cold. Greece has basically had to be bailed out two or three times now, and the reason why was because at the time their GDP was a hundred, their their debt was one hundred and twenty two percent of their GDP. Oh, so we're making we're progress. We're, yeah, not in the good way though. Not in the good not way. in the good way. So as depressing as that is, it's going to get worse. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the disparity between uh, CEOs and the average worker, and and we had originally touched on this in our Rock Festival episode when I was talking about the um, numbers of the the CEO, but at that time it was a private company, so we were not able to get really good numbers. And for those of you who love podcasts, you really, and love economics, together, you said, is that is that everybody in the room? Crickets. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, there's probably some listeners who'd be like, I do Dude. love economics. Yeah, so they don't talk about music at all, but uh, Planet Money is a wonderful podcast that you guys should check out. And they did a whole episode on this, and I had to go through and I had to dig it out. Um, And uh, they aren't quite as entertaining as us, and they certainly don't drop any F-bombs. But um, it's very very, um, educational. So what ended up happening is that there used to be a a law or a tax code a long time ago where CEOs were paid a certain amount of money. And if the company did bad, they still got paid the same amount amount of money. If the company did good, they, they got paid the same amount of money. Right. So there was an economist, and his name was Kevin Murphy, and he wrote a paper in the early 90s, and he said, hey, all these CEOs are getting a free ride, 
and they're basically getting paid even if the the company does shit. And so he says, you know what, you shouldn't be getting paid a whole bunch of money if you're not making the company, if you're not adding value to the company. So uh, I almost said George Clinton. So Bill Clinton was on the campaign trail at the time and used this as a talking point. And in 1993, he decided to change the tax code to try to... Murphy's Law? Murphy. I don't know if that's where it's from. I don't think so. But that's good (laughs) tie-in. Good tie-in. Yeah. So, so Bill Clinton, um, after he was, uh, you know, elected president, he went in and, and he changed the tax code to try to wrangle in the CEO pay. And so what they did was, you're a business owner, Stormy, Zoe is the same thing. Your uh, salary that you pay your people is an expense. Right. And so what the tax code said is they said, hey, look, we're tired of these freeloading uh, CEOs. And so what we're going to do is we're going to only allow you for CEO compensation to write off a million dollars. That's it. So if you pay a CEO $4 million, you can only write off a million dollars of their compensation. And okay. what they were trying to do is they were trying to lower the CEO compensation. But what they also said is they said, unless you tie compensation to performance. Got it. And then there was no limit. Okay. So what ended up happening was CEO compensation exploded because what they started doing is instead of paying them a base salary that they could no longer write off unless it was a million they started giving them stock options. Right. So when you give somebody a stock option, let's say that, you know, the stock is trading at, even if it's on par, let's say the stock is trading at, you know, $15 and I give you a stock option for 15 bucks. Right. You sit on it until the stock is trading at $25. Right. Then you turn around and you cash it in. And you just made $10 a share. Not too shabby. Okay. So that's how stock options work. So when we talked in our tax episode, we talked about the capital gains rate because there's ordinary income, which is what we all pay for income that comes in, which is higher and how has always been traditionally higher. Then there's the capital gains rate. There's a long-term capital gain and a short-term capital gain. The long-term capital gain rate is mostly what applies to the affluent and people who actually hold investment dollars. And so what ends up happening is that they keep that rate nice and low for the people who have a lot of money, but the ordinary income, which is the the income that all of us get paid, you know, 99% and and all that stuff is at a higher percentage rate. So this is how this all ties in. So when we're we're going through this podcast and we're talking about a lot of different things, you, you need to know that they're all related. And so what ended up happening was that the CEO's pay exploded and they got taxed at a lower tax rate than if they had just gotten paid the compensation in the first place. Wow. So do you see how fucked up that ended up turning into. Are they still getting taxed at a lower tax rate? Um, actually, there was just recently a revision that put some type of cap on it, and I did not see what that was. I don't know if it's came into effect yet, but they're trying to correct that actual issue um, and, and try to get it resolved. But from 1992 to 1998, um, salaries for CEOs doubled. And it's all in stock options. Wow. It's all in these these stocks and options and, and warrants. And, and the reason why that they were giving things away so freely is because when you account for a salary for somebody, that's an expense in your accounting procedure. Right. But when you give them a stock option, it isn't listed the same way. So it doesn't hit your financials the same way as a straight up expense would. And we're talking about publicly traded companies. And if you're a public, as we've talked about before, if you're a publicly traded company, you have to have audited financials. And so what ended up happening is that they basically were thinking, hey, these aren't really going to affect us. But what ends up happening is let's say that we're talking about MGM. You own MGM. I own MGM. And Zoe is a CEO. Okay. And she gets a stock option for, I don't know, 500,000 shares. Okay. When she exercises the stock option, what happens is the supply and demand, she's just sold all, all of her stocks, okay? She's now dumped five hundred thousand dollars of share, five hundred thousand shares right. on the market, okay. which is diluting the value our of our shares. Got Correct. It. So they were giving them a lower tax bracket. They're giving them stock options, and then they're diluting the actual shares of the common <laughs> stockholders. It's just, it's just complete and utter bullshit. Right. And so. I was looking to see kind of what the the spread was on some companies that you may know of, um, and it's funny you mentioned Zoe because that what a CEO makes compared to what an average employee makes at Disney is three hundred and sixty seven to one. Hmm. CVS is four hundred and thirty four to one. 
and we've had healthcare. We've had a lot of growth in the healthcare, some spurred by Obamacare, et cetera, et cetera. And I know CVS is not specifically healthcare, but it's it's associated with it. CBS 395 to one, TJ Maxx 327 to one, and 20th Century Fox 311 to one. And all of this came about this one rule where they're actually trying to fix things. And so a lot of times what happens is, is when these politicians are going in and they're they're making changes to the tax code, they don't really understand what they're changing. Right. And the actual effects it's going to do. And what ended up happening was that wedge started really separating out between the one and the 99%. And I don't know if they're going to be able to wrangle it in. And again, it's like the whole, we talk, you mentioned about Bezos um, not having to pay any taxes at Amazon. Yeah, not a bad deal. Bullshit deal, <laughs> as, as far as I'm concerned. You Absolutely. know, I mean, I don't, I mean, I think that the guy totally deserves his money. He worked really hard, but, but I, I don't. Pay taxes. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, but that's, that is what the system has created. And that is why you're seeing such a split in the, the classes. And I don't know, I just, I just wanted everybody to kind of understand when you're talking about a, a, a CEO pay versus an average worker. And I know that you were telling me something about why you think that C, CEOs could, you know, possibly be getting paid more. Yeah, you know, but it's, uh, you know, right now I do agree. It's a little outlandish, but, you know, the average, according to Forbes, the average CEO pay is 361 times greater than their average employee. Mm -hmm. If you take it back to the 1950s, it was 20 times. Yeah. I mean, 20 yeah. times to 361 mm -hmm. times. But, you know, there's something called strata level. And if you've, and, and the strata level is the ability of thinking into the future, making decisions that impact the future, right? Mm -hmm. So when you hire a CEO, the purpose of the CEO is to hire someone that can make decisions with limited information that will, you know, impact the company long term. So oftentimes, if you think about someone's compensation, their compensation is really based on their ability to think into the future. And we reflect their pay the same way. So typically, your lower wage jobs are referred to as I get paid X amount of dollars per hour. Mm -hmm. right. right. Then if you start thinking of the people that start in the hourly jobs and they start moving into management. Well, now what happens is they start thinking in, in you know, lower management, but now I'm getting, you know, $2,000 a week or whatever that dollar amount happens to be per week. And then when you move up in the company structure, now it's a salary and I'm making X amount of dollars per month. And CEOs, they're thinking of a compensation package, you know, or your higher level management, your C-level, I make $100,000 a year or $200,000 a year. And then when you get into the upper level, the CEOs, they're referring to a compensation package that is over an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. And historically, when you think about the strata level thinking, it, 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 it's, um, you know, it's really a concept to think in regards to, um, how can I say this? Um, Basically, the greater your ability to make decisions into the future with a limited amount of information usually has a direct correlation to your compensation level. Well, and when you, you talked about a, a overall compensation package, when you're talking about options, stock options for CEOs and, and those things, that's exactly what happens is yeah. that each year you get a certain amount of stock options. Right. So it's not like they just say, hey, you know, welcome, you're going to be the CEO and we're going to give you, you know, 500,000 shares in stock options. Every single year that ticks over, they get another X, Y, Z, you know, amount of quantity. But the thing is, is that how do you actually really quantify how a person can think into the future? Yes, I understand that, you know, you have, you know, back testing and stuff like that. But even, okay, look at the CEO from, from Coca-Cola when they created new Coke. Right. Okay. That bombed completely. They had to bring, for those of you who don't remember Coke used to be Coke, and then it was called New Coke and Classic Coke, and then they got rid of New Coke, and then it was just Classic Coke for a number of years. Now it's just back to Coke. But I think, if I remember correctly, the CEO, I know he got fired, but he immediately got hired, and I want to say by G, um, GE else, right? or something. And so I'm going, okay, well, if, you're, if we're using that theory, then how – how, how are you quantifying his ability to look into the future if he launched New Coke and actually destroyed the almost destroyed the brand of Coca-Cola? And it was the first time that Pepsi had, I think they temporarily overcame them. Um, it was a, a huge. Did you guys ever have the New Coke Coke fiasco in England? I don't remember that. Oh, you know, and I, I didn't think New Coke was bad, but oh, here we go. OK, so you like this. James Quincy was the CEO and he's a British businessman. 
Ah. Just want to throw that at you, Zoe. Ah. Okay. That's why they didn't have this. That's why they didn't have the. Uh, no, he, the came, he came over here he came to came over cause here trouble, to, yeah. to ruin Absolutely. our ruin our stuff. So thank you very much for that. So anyway, so when you're when you're you know listening things well, about tech hotels. Oh, yeah. No, we're not saying they're good at it. It's just the ability <laughs> of looking into oh, the future. Oh, okay. So what happens is it was actually uh, I can't remember of. Uh, I can't remember the name of the um, Elias Jocks. That was the psychologist. Man, that just came up. Elias Jocks. He was the one that was uh, that came up with this strata level concept. Now I believe he's given it a different name, but he was originally hired by the U.S. Army, and they used uh, and this was in the 1950s, and they used his methodology when they would give training to determine you know someone's ability to um, think into the future, and it. My understanding, even to this day, it's still part of the criteria when they start um, um, elevating officers through the ranks as they become generals. So mm. if you take a five-star general, the thought process is that general can think strategically into the future to, uh, you know, to a greater degree than a captain or a one-star general. So if you take theoretically, new, well, if, so if you take New Coke as, a, as an example, what strategy went into that where he was like, you know, we have a great brand here. Uh, let's make it new. I don't know if it was the whole thing. Like, you know how you'll see detergent in the supermarket that's the same fucking detergent for years and years. Right. It's like new scent. I'm like, nope, same scent. But they, they don't have to, they could put new on anything. You know what, probably what happened, and I don't know, but my guess would be is they were looking at some numbers and they didn't like it. So the CEO went to his marketing or his sales staff. He went to someone and he's like, we've got to come up with something. And there was probably someone in the room that was very eloquent at delivering a message in regards probably to why British. they needed new Coke. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they had a lot of fancy charts and graphs that supported their narrative and an mm -hmm. accent. And unfortunately, the CEO bought into the idea and the concept because I'm sure it wasn't his idea. He probably set people out to do things and whoever was the most mas masterful at delivering a narrative and a message that he bought into and it cost him his job don't believe the hype Ooh. yeah and that and that happens a lot because what ends up happening is when you when you get off track or you miss expectations on wall street and you have shareholders then they need to the company needs to do something to show hey shareholders we're trying to turn things around to make sure that your your stock value stays the same and even though it wasn't the CEO's idea, it's kind of like we have to do something drastic so they know, oh, now there's a new you know, CEO that comes in and now everything's going to turn around and the, the stock value is going to go up. And um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you have companies that go through multiple CEOs Absolutely. and they're still struggling. So uh, again, when, you know, when you're looking at the discrepancies and things like this, it's important for you to understand that the salary might not be there but the options are what's actually pushing them over. And with the favorable tax status of it, that's Eric. where you continue to get a 1% and a 99%. So I know that this is kind of not the most joyous podcast, but it's important for you to understand. And I wanted to circle back after the Rock Festival podcast where I mentioned it. So hopefully the uh, daughters of this gentleman who wrote The Lion Sleeps Tonight will get something eventually. However, they're going up against Disney, which now owns everybody. So I don't really know how successful that's going to be, even though I wish them tons of luck. Absolutely. Well, that's they're done. I mean. Oh, they're already done. Oh, it's, shit. It's, I mean, it's settled, and I think they still get a, a small amount of royalties, uh, you know. Oh, no. I think that that's, that's wrong. The, the, the agreement ended uh, at some point in time. They may still so get they don't some, even get anything now at all? I think they, I, they may get a small amount. But the, the whole point was that. They didn't get shit. They got really in relatively speaking much like our studio musicians very little and the man himself who who wrote it got diddly squat so well rest in peace hopefully he uh, has his riches uh, elsewhere absolutely all right thank you for listening we'll talk at you soon cheerio bye-bye thanks for listening if you like us subscribe wherever you get your podcasts